Welcome to uh, SPAN 312, Hopscotch, uh, Latin American Literature and uh, in Translation. And today I'm very, very pleased to have with me my friend uh, Aaron Graf Ziven, who teaches at the University of Southern California and is the author, amongst many other books, of uh, I think most recently this one, An Archaeology's uh, Reading as Misreading, but written and published and worked widely on. Latin America, both Brazilian and uh, Spanish American uh, literature. So, Aaron, thanks so much for doing this and being part of this uh, conversation. And to start off with, just very you know open question: uh, How would you suggest approaching, or how do you do you suggest to your students that they approach or think about Latin American literature, whatever that is? John, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I would say that I typically take a pretty non-traditional approach to teaching Latin American literature. That's true whether I'm teaching undergraduates for whom it's, you know, maybe their very first time uh, studying Latin American texts, um, but it's also true when I'm teaching PhD students who may have um, lots of experience um, and lots of background uh, in uh, Latin American literary studies. Um, when I say non-traditional, I probably mean a few things. First, I tend to not stick to what is considered to be the, the canon or kind of what has been uh, at least conventionally or traditionally agreed upon as the most important text of the field. Um, that's not to say that I don't think that there isn't a place for that. Um, I think that an argument in favor of studying the canon again at any aspect any moment in your in your kind of educational life is that there's it, it kind of gives you some common ground right with with others so for example if you're only reading really marginal texts that no one's ever heard of that's great and you're actually going to have some really really cool thoughts and ideas about those texts but you may not have a lot to talk about when you sit down with someone else to have a conversation so what i love about Garcia Marquez, or Cortázar, or Borges, or Luis Pector, or, uh, uh, among many others, many of whom you've, you've studied uh, in this course, um, is that there's, there's always something to talk about. And that's true for specialists, for people who have PhDs, who are academics, who are specialists. Um, but it's also true for just your kind of general, you know, person on the street that you meet who has, you know, some degree of educational background. Um, uh, usually if people ask me what I do and I tell them that I'm a professor of Latin American literature and they've studied very little, they'll say, oh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. So there's some common ground and, and it's a starting point. Um, I often will use that starting point then to call into question, well, why is it that he's the most famous uh, Latin American author um, outside of Latin America, right? If you ask Latin Americans, if you're in Colombia, maybe so. But if you're in Argentina, if you're in Mexico, if you're in Cuba, if you're in Peru, um, that's not the, the first author people are going to are going to ask about. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a starting point, but it's not necessarily an, an, an ending point for me. Now, when people ask me, who's your favorite author, I usually have two answers. Um, the first is usually Borges, again, because it tends to establish some sort of common ground. Most people have heard of Borges. Um, many people have read Borges. Uh, Borges, to me, is one of the most brilliant writers, I think, because you can read him on so many different levels. So again, it's your first time reading Latin American literature. It's not going to be hard for you to figure out what's going on on the level of plot in a typical Borges story. Maybe some of the essays are a bit more philosophical and, and opaque. Um, the story, you're, you're generally going to get what's going on, um, but the possibilities of interpretation and sort of deciphering what's going on are infinite, I would say. <clears throat> so you can, and I do, I return to the same story again and again and again and again, and every time I see something I didn't notice before, if I'm teaching it, my students will usually bring up things that I hadn't noticed upon the first or the second or the third or the fourth, et cetera, reading. So um, that's what's so exciting about Borges. Um, the second writer that I often answer is Cesar Daida. So you'll hear that I'm giving Argentine examples. Um, that's that's um, mostly the area in which I work. 
Um, Seth Adaira is great because number one, a lot of his work has been translated into English. So people in North America are asking me, it's something that generally they can get their hands on. Like Borges, he writes a lot of short fiction. So whether they're short stories or kind of novellas, um, there are, there's a lot out there and it's, it's really easy for people to get their hands on. What's cool about Aida is he's really, really funny. And he's really, really philosophical and clever and kind of complex. So you, again, can can read whatever Aida um, uh, suits you or speaks to you. So you started by answering that you taught in a non-traditional way. But actually, I was kind of interested. You seem to be making quite a case for the canon. Maybe, you know, uh, this idea of a common ground, uh, a starting point from which to... Uh, you know, continue conversations and discussions and interpretations. There's no one perhaps more canonical in some ways than Borges. Uh, Ira, it, perhaps less so, but, you know, I mean, he's he's not exactly, uh, he's not exactly non-canonical. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, um, yeah, I, I wonder why, uh, what what is non-traditional about the way that you do teach uh, and 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 why and why do you choose then why would one want to choose right to to leave the canon behind at least at some point great um so that was sort of my going into detail about how one would establish common ground which i i, I do find uh, extremely valuable but a typical class that i teach again really at any level um, tends not to be organized um geographically or chronologically um, generally, I choose a theme or more often a set of related themes or problems, and then I go through a series of texts or other um, uh, uh, works. So it could be film, it could be music, uh, it could be um, photography, um, it could be sculpture, it could be a number of other kind of um, works that are um, in a different medium. Um, um, but literature usually ha uh, plays a pretty strong role in, in, in most of my classes. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I teach courses like that too. And sometimes I wonder, and maybe you wonder the same thing, if, you know, say we take a theme, I don't know, uh, I don't know, violence, politics, ethics, maybe a theme that you may have taught once or twice, I suspect. Then the, the question, another question might be, why restrict ourselves to Latin American literature, right? So the other side of it is not not just you know literature or, or but but what is what is the consistency? What is what does Latin Americanness? And again, you pointed out also that there's different countries and they have their own canons and 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 assumptions and starting points. But if we're if we're investigating a theme or an idea through literature, wh yeah, why why restrict ourselves to those parameters? Do you think? Another great question. So um, it depends on the course that I'm teaching. So I teach at USC, I teach a variety of courses. I teach in the Department of Latin American and Iberian Cultures, but I also teach um, general education classes and I also teach comparative literature classes. So sometimes I'm just focusing on Latin America and sometimes I'm doing more kind of comparative, it could be North American, it could be European. Um, so it kind of depends on, it depends on what I'm teaching. <clears throat> For example, when I after I wrote my book on um, Inquisition allegories, I was very interested in kind of looking at representations of torture and interrogation. And that was in many, many, many different contexts. So we had sort of the Latin American examples, especially during and in the wake of the Southern Cone dictatorships. Um, but we also looked at, um, at the time, more um, current uh, uh, US related examples uh, of torture. Um, we read Kafka, you know, we read all, all kinds of of things um, together. So it just depends, I guess. So, uh, yes, I mean, I guess the, the so the, again, it's a, it's a question, you know, I, again, ask myself and sort of implicitly sort of pose of the students. I'm not entirely sure if how interested they are, but they often come with an idea of what Latin America is, right? Mm. Um, based on I don't know, different things based on music, for instance, based on whatever sure. travel they may have done, based on right, based on ideas about, for instance, magic realism when it comes to mm -hmm. um, uh, literature. And then one of the things that I think we do is to say, well, it's more complicated than that, right? 
And at t- and there's no one Latin America, for instance. And I wonder if sometimes you feel that what we do is sort of um, at, th- at the end of a, a semester, perhaps, again, thinking about courses that we teach, the idea of Latin America kind of disappears. It, it, do you feel that? And and if so, is it a good thing or a bad thing? It may be a good thing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a great question. So I would say when I'm teaching classes on Latin America, but also when I'm teaching classes um, on Jewishness, <clears throat> which is one of my areas also of, of research, um, I do often begin by asking students kind of what comes up? What do you imagine when you think of sort of these signifiers? And sometimes you run into stereotypes of sort of the exoticized other from people who have very little familiarity with a certain culture or a certain tradition or a, a series of traditions, or what they imagine that to be. But very often, um, kind of the most um, steadfast defenders of a certain idea of identity are pe- are people who themselves feel that they belong to that group, mm-hmm. right? So <clears throat> if I come from a Jewish family, if I come from you know, a Latina family, especially in a diasporic uh, uh, context, I I might be um, very attached to a certain notion of identity. And that might be very, very meaningful to me. And so then part of the class or the beginning of the class is is kind of setting up, well, there might be some echoes of certain experiences and certain histories, but in fact, they're quite often contradicted um, by other sets of kind of histories and experiences by people who might uh, share that sort of same identity signifier. So I, I would say that that's something that um, that we try to tackle. Um, the other thing that I would say, and and again, this is this has been true in the Jewish studies classes that I've taught as well, but but very much so in in Latin American literary studies is um, really emphasizing the degree, the intensity, the um, frequency with which Latin American writers and theorists try to themselves conceive of an idea of either Latin America or something more local or something more regional. So we also go through sort of um, local, whether they're ethnic identities, whether they're national identities, um, and kind of look at why, why ha- and ask why has that been a priority for intellectuals, for writers, for thinkers, for critics, and then kind of unpack it uh, from there. And. Yeah, and and then I, I actually I wanted to circle back to Borges a little. Uh, my students, at least this past semester, uh, struggled with Borges. That may have been my fault. I may have presented Borges badly or, or or something, and it became a sort of running joke through, throughout the semester. It's like John's going to talk about Borges again. I'm going to say, I'm going to yeah. Every single class, we're going to come back to Borges because we did it. We did it. We didn't do enough with Borges, and perhaps um, I mean Borges. He's got this famous quotation. I don't know if it's uh, apocryphal in which he talks about the thing you know that something is, um, you know, Arabic literature is there's there's no ca- uh, camels, right? In the that, Quran, that, that, that there's there's no that, that you don't need to you don't need to emphasize these things that you uh, that you take for granted, right? You don't need to do that kind of I don't know self exoticization. And yet, as you point out, other authors maybe again not just from the region. This is not just about Latin American literature want to kind of display those markers uh, of identity. Um, but perhaps we're drawn to those, we being whoever the people who are paid to study this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Who um, who don't necessarily want to put on those kinds of displays, right? Who want to enter other sorts of conversation, which is not simply the recapitulation of forms of uh, identity. Is that is is that yeah. part of the attraction of Borges too? Sure, um, absolutely, and um, you know that's from El Escrito Argentino y la Tradición, the, the Argentine writer and tradition, which is one of my favorite texts. Um, uh, in which, by the way, he does make an analogy to um, to Jewish writers and Jewish intellectuals, Irish writers and Irish intellectuals, in response to kind of kind of a minority writer within a majority culture, and talking about that relationship. Um, but of course, he's responding to um, his compatriots who are engaged in a, a certain relation to, in this case, the the um, the, uh, the gauchesque, right? The the genero gauchesque, the, the gauchesque genre. So he, so I think by by positing it as here's a disagreement, right? And so where do we where do we what do we think about this disagreement? Where do we side in the sort of debate or 
um, this tension being on the one hand, really wanting to assert originality, kind of a local autochthonous experience, but also not just experience, like a literary tradition. Like what is it about the, the poetry or the song from the from the Gauchesque genre, which by the way, um, fascinated Borges, right? But he just wants to posit a, a kind of more unorthodox uh, uh, relation uh, to it. Um, so it's kind of like, um, how are we to understand those different responses to uh, to a to a certain tradition and to the construction um, of that tradition? I would say though that the the Borges story I teach the most probably is the eth ethnographer, precisely because um, it calls into question um, the possibility of going off to study the other. So if you remember, the ethnographer tells the story of uh, a PhD student who is going to do, his name is Fred Murdoch, he's from Texas, and he's going off to study the uh, a Native American community, uh, unnamed, um, and he goes off to do his field work, and he spends, I think, several years uh, in this community. Um, he becomes part of the community until he's dreaming uh, of Buffalo, and he um, has kind of an intimate knowledge of kind of the ways and beliefs of this community, um, and then he, and then he leaves. And he goes back and he tells his dissertation advisor, um, you know what, I'm, I'm, I've torn up my notes. I've decided I want to abandon uh, ethnography. I want to abandon the discipline of anthropology. Um, you know, it's not for me. And, and, and the, you know, the advisor, of course, is horrified and says, why? Why would you do this? And he says, well, um, because what I learned is not something that I could, that I could communicate, that I could write up in a dissertation or in the thesis. And his advisor says, well, why is it because it's untranslatable? We don't have the proper words for it. He said, no, 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 I could translate it. I could say it in a bunch of different ways, um, but that wouldn't get to the secret that I learned, which was basically the, the road that I traveled, right, in this whole process. So this idea that what one learns is not kind of an objective fact. It's not information. It's not a secret that one can discover, but rather something that happens to you, right? And, and that's true for all of us. When we're really learning, something in us is undone. Something in us is sort of shaken or thrown off um, in a way that I think is um, really beautifully fictionalized, fictionalized in that book. And then, of course, it ends um, quite humorously with him getting a job at the, getting married, getting divorced, and getting a job as the librarian at Yale, back in the university. So, I mean, that makes me think, too, Again, I just started teaching another class yesterday, in fact, and I, I asked the students at the beginning, why are you in this class? What, what's, what's drawn you here? Why do you want to be reading uh, Hispanic fiction in this case, both Spain mm -hmm. and Latin America? And one of the things they said, well, or some of them said, well, this is a way of finding out about people from Spain and, and Latin America. So a sort of ethnographic interest, right? The, by reading the texts that come from Spain, Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, wherever it is, we discover it, you know, we, mm -hmm. it's a sort of proxy for, the, uh, you know, their lives and experiences. And I don't know what those are the kinds of things that, that was saying. Um, and yet I also, I also like the idea, I like the way you put it just there, that, uh, you know, that there's, there's no such secret or that what the point is, you know, that something in us, you know, comes undone. And I'm trying to tell the, sell the students on that, you know, over the course of the, you know, the, the semester. Right. Right. Okay. But also negotiate with the things that drew them in the first mm -hmm. place. I, I wonder how you think about that. How that works for you, right? You've got you've got the the demands or the desires or the things that that draw students, which may be about I don't know Garcia Marquez. It may be about going back to those conversations that you have with with people who who's your favorite writer and so on. And yet you want to try and twist those or draw or de make those desires and and ambitions and and i don't know deviate in a in a different direc direction towards something which is quite different how, how do you mm. negotiate that well i guess i would say i would distinguish between desires and fantasies right so we don't want to help students kind of reify some um kind of magical um fantastical image of this kind of exoticized um world of otherness at the same time there is a desire to go beyond ourselves that I think is wonderful. And in fact, that is very much related, I think, to the, the experience of kind of um, 
coming undone. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a whole other conversation, really. It's, it's, it's quite a complex uh, uh, conversation about how, how desirable is it to, 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 to come undone. Um, um, but, um, but I would say that you can have it both ways. In other words, um, there can be something that brings students um, or, or newcomers, you know, say students in the, in the most expansive sense, it could be students in a classroom or just newcomers to a particular culture, a particular tradition or a discipline. Um, so there's a reason why you're there in the first place, and that might kind of give you this sort of energy or excitement. Um, and and that I think that you can stay with that. I think you can I think you can have that excitement and be unpacking. Well, what what caused that excitement? What what gave me that idea? Why did I have the image that Latin America would be like this? Like everyone would be kind of passionate, or everyone would be eating spicy food, or right? What why did I think those things? And and where did they come from? And and sort of have that, kind of ask those difficult questions. So. Continue with this idea, I suppose, of negotiating with or thinking about student expectations, and, and not just students, right, but uh, maybe fairly common expectations, uh, but now more around literature. I find that students often come into class, uh, again, not just students, with the notion that, uh, the, back to secrets, at the center of every text is some kind of secret, right? And it's our job to try to, you know, unwrap that and get to that, whatever is underneath. They often say that, you know, behind the words, underneath, right? And mm -hmm. um, and and that also often produces a certain amount of anxiety. If they don't feel they've got there, if they don't feel they've got the correct keys to open up the text and find this secret, then they've done something wrong. And uh, in your book, uh, amongst other things, uh, you offer, I think, a, a very different model, right? This, mm. this notion of, of reading as misreading and and, right. and it's it's not about getting to some kind of yes truth or secret which is somehow enveloped within these otherwise sometimes uh complex uh words uh, i wonder if you can talk a little bit about that that model for thinking about what we do when we when we read sure yeah so the the my last book um focused on motifs of error blindness um, opacity, misunderstanding um, in literature. So finding like when that happens or when it comes up as a theme or 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 a trope, um, but also thinking about um, misreading as a as a method, right? In other words, that by being attentive to the blind spots um, or points of uh, uh, untranslatability, right? That which we cannot fully understand in a text that we actually might. Uh, gain insight about that text um, precisely in that moment and through through that experience. So I actually do um, remain committed to um, truth as as part of the reading experience, but but it's a I think it's what I call deconstructive truth. Um, uh, it's not a truth that I can necessarily prove with uh, scientific fact, although I I think that scientific fact is is very important in a post-truth era. In other words, if we're thinking about climate change, we do actually want to analyze the change in water temperature and air temperature, right? We, so we do wanna pay attention to facts in certain uh, circumstances. In a literary text though, um, we're looking for different kinds of evidence. And that's why in a literary text, the um, possibilities for interpretation are infinite, but that doesn't mean that every interpretation is right. Um, so um, so I, I think that the, the commitment to truth would entail for me um, really taking a serious, and this is, this is why I think it's interesting that you've been talking so much about play, um, a serious approach in the sense that um, on the one hand, um, there's not one answer. On the other hand, it's only by kind of having a, a, a sort of intimate, very close reading that one can find evidence to support what might sound like a really outlandish interpretation uh, of a given text. So it might be um, what I have to say or what I see in the text might not at all be what, what you see um, at first glance, but I'm gonna show you by saying, look, five different times uh, the color red appears. Why is that? Let's pay attention to that, right? And let's talk about why that is. It can't just be, oh, red's important, even though it's nowhere to be found in the text, right? That would be a stretch. We need to find textual evidence. And then by putting together the, the textual evidence, we might be able to come up with something that that um, that other people um, don't quite see when they read. 
and this goes back also to what you were saying about why Borges, for instance, to start off with. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, returning to Borges, uh, there's always something new. There's always, uh, you know, you notice something new. There's always the possibility of new conversations and, and new interpretations. Um, what makes some, okay, what, what makes some texts more amenable mm. to that kind of reading, perhaps, right? To, to that reading for other kinds of truth or that reading for other kinds of... Um, yeah, way, ways of thinking. What makes what what makes some texts more amenable to that kind of uh, thinking and that kind of misreading than others? That is an amazing question. I'm not sure if I have an easy answer to that, but I will simply say that it it appears that some, that some don't. When you go back time and time again, and don't seem to ever exhaust the text, so I think it's almost. Like something that, for example, you and I might, again, might disagree about which texts have kind of more potential for this kind of infinite reading or misreading. Um, but it's almost through that, through the practice, through the kind of repetition or differential repetition, going back again and again and again and seeing what happens. Um, something that I'm doing right now in my current project is I'm looking at um, how a work of art from a different medium can adapt translate, distort, rework, reenact uh, a text or a work of art from, from, from a medium that's, that's ostensibly different, right? So we, we think we have a literary text and we think that we have an experimental film. Uh, the experimental film, so again, let's take Borges uh, as, 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 as a case study. I'm very interested in a, an experimental film by an Argentine um, uh, artist named Narcissa Hirsch. Uh, she was a pioneer of uh, Argentine experimental film in the 70s. Um, she's actually still alive and making films. She's 96 years old now. And she has a one minute film. It's available online. You can go watch it. It's amazing called El Aleph, the Aleph. And it is a complete distortion of Borges' story, right? You'll, if you know the story, you'll recognize it, not just by the title, but you'll recognize uh, phrases. And yet what she does is she completely takes apart what is really the most famous scene in that um, in the story, which is the scene in the basement uh, uh, in the uh, where the protagonist uh, comes um, face to face with the, the Aleph, right? Um, she takes apart the prosaic sentences and I argue turns them into poetry uh, through, through kind of the repetition of the same sounds over and over and over again. But it's only through the distortion of Borges's text by Hirsch that I, for example, was able to hear, oh, wait a minute, that repetition, that orality, that poetry was always already in the Borges text. I just, I wasn't attuned to it. Someone else, a better reader, a better listener might have been. It took me pulling back and hearing this kind of, uh, hearing and watching this really kind of wild experimental reworking of the story that I was able to um, perceive or, or attune my ears to, to something that was, that was already in the Borges text. So, I guess finally, because we're, we're we're coming to uh, out of out of time, and again, this is a, a question I ask myself as well. So, if all reading is infinite, right? We don't exhaust the texts, um, and we could go on. We could go on talking about Borges, but presumably also other texts as well. That's the, that's the question about why mm -hmm. some texts more than others, right? But but mm -hmm. we could. Um, how do we? I, I always like the idea. It comes from Winnicott, the you know the British psychoanalyst. It, it talks about uh, being you, you, the, you don't want to be a perfect mother. You don't want to be a good. You want to be a good enough mother. When you're talking about motherhood, right? At what point do you know you've done a good enough reading? Mm. So you know you, you you know you haven't got to the end of the text. You're never going to get to the end of the text. But right. at what point do you feel okay? It's time to move on from Borges or my current project or whatever it is because right. You know, it's not finished. It's not going to be finished. But it's I get, hit, this is this is where I choose to stop. This is good enough. Let's move on to something else. I would say that in terms of when one is finished with a book project, which is which is quite its own thing. I think one is finished when one hates it. 
when one is sick of it. One doesn't want to think about it anymore. That ideally changes. You move away from it. It goes through the publication process. And then you, you kind of revisit it and say, oh, actually, I kind of like it. And it's, it, it's okay. But at that point, you have exhausted at least your own possibilities, right, of mining the text. That doesn't mean that the text has been exhausted, but I've exhausted kind of, I've gotten as far as I can, I can get right now. I might revisit in a year, in 10 years, and, uh, and, and find uh, more to do. Um, but I would say, uh, just to just to maybe um, refer to my other favorite writer, Cesar Raida, um, you know, I want to go back to the to maybe in conclusion to the idea of play. Um, I absolutely think that reading and learning and thinking can be conceived of as play in the sense that um, we 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 don't want a fixed uh, relation to one idea in the text, but we want to kind of have a certain flexibility or movement and entertaining other possibilities, thinking about um, what might ha what might happen. Um, I don't know that I would liken it to hopscotch, but I might liken it to another game that you that you talk about, which is which is dice, right? Um, so in one of uh, Aida's uh, short fictions called Triano, uh, the two um, protagonists, the protagonist and kind of the, the, the second most important uh, character. Um, it's kind of a, an Aida-like figure and an Arturo Carrera-like figure, Argentine poet, meet a painter, right? So necessarily they're meeting someone who works in another medium, right? And the painter says to them, I'll read a passage. You two who are in that line of work, and that line of work is literature, try this. Assemble 397 cubes, the number of stanzas in the first part of Martin Fierro, which is, you know, kind of most fa famous foundational fictions of Argentina, La Ida. Each cube contains one stanza with a verse inscribed on each of its six faces. Shake up the cubes and throw them as if they were dice. Then place them in a line exactly how they fall and transcribe in that order the verses that appear on the top. It'll give you a poem of 397 verses derived from the original, but different. You can repeat the operation however many times you like, and it'll always give you a different poem. How I long to read a poem like that. It makes me think that cubist literature hasn't yet been born. So I'll get to the cubism in a moment, but what I love about it is that reading is like throwing those dice, right? It is like throwing those cubes and seeing, okay, what would happen if we were to put it in this order? What would happen if we were to rearrange it? And I would say, and I think someone asked me this question once, if we were to throw the dice and it did come up with the same faces in the same order, wouldn't we also have the possibility of a different reading or a different meaning, even in that ostensibly the same text, right? So, um, so that's what he calls cubist literature, which is being able to see the same object from different angles at the same time, which I think is kind of a cool idea. I, I like that a lot. I, I like that a lot. I, I guess, and we really are out of time, but I, I feel the need a little bit to defend some of the things that I've been trying to think about it and suggest about play, mm -hmm. which is that many games are a combination of, of chance and skill, right? And mm. uh, some more than others, right? And the 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 weighting between the two um, uh, varies. And a, a game that is uh, without chance at all is, you know, that's that's no fun, right? You know, if you if mm. you if you know already what's going to happen, even there's a spectator, right? You know. You go see, I don't know, a football game or hockey or whatever it is, right? And and you know always who's going to win. It's like, well, what wh what's the what's what's the point in that? There's always the chance mm -hmm. that you know the underdog will win or something, and that is what gives the motivation. You you know, you may be supporting a rubbish club, and but you right. think that okay, today, this Saturday, in, well, there's always the chance that something may different and and, and something may come out different. Right. Uh, so chance is important, right? Absolutely, chance is important, but. I, I I guess I'm dissatisfied. I think games that are only chance are also dissatisfying mm. in their way. I suppose the sense that you are 
that you're learning something, right? That that you can get better at this. That the next time you're faced with the same set of verses, you the next time you're faced with the same sort of situation, um, you can come up with something different, and that that's not merely because you know the the world is different, the river, you know, you don't 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 jump into the same river twice, but because you're building on your experiences, and in some way you're a better reader. And I suppose my dream is mm-hmm. that that's what students also feel at the end of our courses, right? That mm-hmm. at the end of it, they've become better readers, and that's not simply a matter of chance. That's something that, and it may not be down to me either, right? It's, it's as much because the the more you read, the better you read. You know, the, it's much. But those experiences of reading, sometimes challenging texts like Borges or Ira, challenging in different ways, right? Uh, mean that they are better faced to deal with similar texts in the future. That's my hope. That's my dream, at least. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I'm in complete agreement with you. And in some ways, that's why, that, that's sort of where I took issue with um, when you equate play to children's play. In other words, play is not always children's play. It may be children's play, but it also may be quite different. And it might be even serious, right? So I think the repetition you're talking about, right? Developing skills. Skills not something you're born with, right? This kind of skill is not something that you're born with. You do it through this repetition, through throwing the dice over and over and over and over again. It's only by doing it 10 times, 20 times, 100, 1,000 that I think really sophisticated readings can and can can emerge. And then you begin to learn to detect that yourself. Like, oh, okay, I didn't do so well that time. I might try again because I think I'm not convinced by my own argument. Well... We could carry on talking, especially about play, I think. I will say, children's play is also serious. It's deadly serious, it can be. Mm, you know? mm, so uh, mm, the question mm. of seriousness and fun is also, well, you know, there, there's a, we could talk about that for, I think, for, for a long time. And mm. the fact that we haven't exhausted the topics and themes and questions that we pose ourselves or that Latin American literature teaching it poses ourselves is also, you know, symptomatic in some way. Erin, thanks so much. For your time and expertise and and, and thoughts and and insight, um, it's been a, a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John.